시작하도록 하겠습니다. 어, 오늘 개회식은 어, 6.25 전쟁 낙후 인사 가족 협의회 이밀 이사장님께서 말씀 주시겠습니다. 자리로 모시겠습니다. 박수 부탁드립니다. 
Following their abduction, they were subjected to discrimination in North Korea, and that such discrimination continues to affect the abductees and their descendants. International humanitarian law requires states to repatriate civilians interned during an armed conflict. Despite obligations set out in the Geneva Convention, no civilians from south of the de demarcation line prior to 24th of June 1950, residing in North Korea at the end of the Korean War, were assisted in returning to the south. In addition to constituting violations of humanitarian law, International human rights law considers these abductions to constitute enforced disappearances that violate basic human rights, both for the victims themselves and their families who continue to live in uncertainty. Next month, we will mark the fifth anniversary of the coming into force of the International Convention on the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearances. And this treaty has been ratified by 46 states and signed by 94, but neither South nor North Korea has signed or ratified the convention. The convention in Article 1 states that no one shall be subjected to enforced disappearance, and goes on to say, no exceptional circumstances, circumstances whatsoever, whether a state of war or a threat of war, internal political instability, or any other internal uh, or any other public emergency may be invoked as a justification for enforced disappearance. Its creation was an outcome of the persistent lo lobbying and advocacy by relatives of the disappeared and other human rights defenders. So ladies and gentlemen, the findings of the Commission of in Inquiry were based on information, including a list compiled by Quafu, I believe, of 96,013 uh, names. Um, to compile such a list in itself must have been an enormous task and, and um, one that required a great deal of tenacity. Um, in spite of this, as, as I was going through the material submitted to me by Quafu to prepare for this conference, um, it was perhaps the testimonies of individuals, individual people who've been affected by this problem that brought to the fore the most the grave human rights violation that this uh, abduction constituted. So, one one um, testimony that was given a, a, a young a survivor who, whose father disappeared when she was a very young child stated in, in some of these materials that my grandparents waited for their son to come back until they passed away. Now my mother is getting old. If my father is still alive, he's 91 years old, I did not even have a chance to call him dad. With such testimonies, I think it's sufficiently clear that this is a pressing and urgent human rights issue. I hope that our discussions today will provide new insights that will help us move towards the resolution of civilian abductions during the Korean War. The abductions are human rights violations, and their resolution is also a fundamental element of sustainable peace on the Korean Peninsula. And thank you very much, and I wish you all fruitful discussions uh, during today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you 그리고 코사보에서 오신 에, 크리스투인 에팔로시 변호사님 그리고 어, 과테말라에서 이 크리스천 어, 길베르토 곤잘레스 변호사님 그리고 오늘 발표와 어, 토론을 해주실 여러분들 그리고 어, 이 참석하신 여러 어, 분들 지금부터 어, 800년 전에 에, 영국의 존 왕이 마그나 카르타에 서명을 했습니다. 내용은 간단하지만 전제 군주의 절대 권력도 룰에 따라야 된다는 어, 그 시작이었습니다. 이러한 정신이 발전해서 
어, 결국은 결국은 1776년에는 어, 미국이 독립 선언을 했고 1789년에는 어, 프랑스의 대혁명으로 어, 전개되었습니다. 지난 20세기 전반에 에, 인류는 한 세대만에 두 번의 에, 세계의 에, 대전을 경험했습니다. 그 반성으로 유엔 어, 헌장의 에, 인권 조항들이 에, 들어갔고 그 인권 조항들의 기초 위에서 유엔을 중심으로 국제 인권법이 크게 발전해 왔고 지금 아주 활발하게 발전해 가고 있습니다. 그러한 유엔 체제하의 인권 규범, 즉 2차 대전 이후의 인권 규범과는 별도로 전시국제법, 국제인도법이라고 얘기하는데요. 전시국제법도 진화했습니다. 앙리 뒤낭이라는 스위스의 그 기업인이 1851년 이탈리아 통일전쟁의 솔페리노 전투를 직접 참관을 하게 됐는데 그 후에 솔페리노의 회상이 되는 어, 그, 그 글을 썼습니다. 그 솔페리노 회상이 지식인들의 공감을 얻어가지고 1863년에는 국제적십자사를 창설하게 되었습니다. 1864년에는 전쟁, 무력 충돌에서도 규칙은 있어야 된다는 그런 주장을 각국 정부한테 설득을 해서 정부 대표 간 회의에서 어, 제네바 협약을 어, 채택을 했습니다. 이렇게 발전한 전시국제법, 즉 무력 충돌 시에 적용될 규범들은 1949년에 제네바 4개 협약으로 이렇게 굉장히 종합적으로 정리가 되었습니다. 세계의 조약은 전투원들, 그 상병자, 그리고 어, 그 포로 이런 사람들에 대해서 어, 규정을 하고 있죠. 네 번째 협약은 전쟁을 할때 전혀 관련이 없는 민간인을 보호해야 된다는 이러한 어, 그, 어, 규정인데 그것이 채택이 됐습니다. 1949년 제네바 협약에는 북한도 나중에 가입했을 뿐만 아니라 이제는 조약에 가입하고 상관없이 국제관습법이 되었습니다. 6.25 전쟁 납북 인사 가족협의회는 북한 정권이 전쟁 기간 중 납치해 간 민간인 9만 6천 13명을 확인하였습니다. 실제로는 12만 명 이상이 납북되었을 것으로, 되었을 것으로 추정하고 있습니다. 민간인 보호에 관한 전시 국제법 이전부터 한국 사회의 전통은 가족을 정말 그 중요하게 생각해 왔습니다. 이러한 사회에서 아버지가 납치되면 가정은 깨어집니다. 북한 정권은 휴전이 된후 62년이 지났는데도 그들을 가족의 품으로 되돌려 보내지 않았습니다. 생사 여부도 제대로 확인해 주지 않고 있습니다. 깨어진 가정을 전쟁 이전으로 복원시키지 않는 것은 전시국제법 위반입니다. 그것은 야만 바로 그 자체라고 생각을 합니다. 휴전협정 교섭 과정에서 납북자 문제에 관해 많은 시간 논의를 했음에도 불구하고 노동력이 필요한 북한 측은 마이동풍이었습니다. 막판에 아이젠하워 대통령의 선거 공약에 따라 정전협정을 서두른 바람에 전시 납북자 문제는 우선순위에서 밀렸습니다. 시양산인이라는 표현을 쓰면서 휴전 성립 후에 논의하기로 어, 했습니다. 그러나 휴전 후 막상 협의에 들어가서는 북한 측은 남한으로 귀환할 납북자가 한 사람도 없다는 통첩으로 문제를 봉쇄해 버렸습니다. 1951년 8월에 결성된 6.25 사변 피랍치 인사 가족회의 이밀 
인사장의 모친도 임원이 되어 귀한 척구 활동을 어, 한그 어, 자료들을 저희들은 많이 보았습니다. 대한민국 정부도 어, 북한 당국에게 귀환을 촉구하였으나 반응은 담벼락 같았습니다. 1972년까지도 경제적으로 우위에 있던 북한 정권이 납치 인사들을 대남 공작 활동에 이용하게 되자, 이용하게 되자 한국 정부는 위감을 느꼈고 결과적으로 일부 가족들이 커다란 불이익을 받기도 했습니다. 대한민국은 자유민주주의와 기본적 인권을 기본으로 하는 헌법의 기초 위에서 발전해 왔습니다. 그러나 권위주의 시기 그리고 북한 전공과의 관계 인전에 너무 치중하던 시기에는 납치자 송환 요구에 강한 힘을 발휘하지, 발휘하지 못했습니다. 이제 대한민국은 정치 민주화도 이루었고 자신감을 가지고 원칙에 충실할 수 있게 되었습니다. 아시아 지역에서는 가장 모범적인 인권 선도국이 되었습니다. 외국인 근로자들의 고도, 고용 허가제를 도입한다든지 난민 인정의 폭을 이제 늘려간다든지 하는 그러한 진전도 이루고 있습니다. 일본보다도 앞서가는 나라가 되었습니다. 2010년에 6.25 전쟁 납북 피해 진상 규명 및 납북 피해자 명예 회복에 관한 법률도 재정 시행하게 되었습니다. 인권 분야에서의 이러한 진전에는 시민단체들의 노력이 매우 중요한 역할을 하고 있습니다. 2000년 재발족한 6.25 전쟁 납북인사 가족협의회도 매우 중요한 역할을 하고 있습니다. 이 기회를 빌려서 감사드리고 싶습니다. 가족협의회 회원들이 활동은 큰 감명을 주고 있습니다. 자신들의 이렇게 있지만은 개인적 고통을 사귀면서 풀뿌리 민주주의 확산을 도모하고 있습니다. 이 시대의 노블레스 오블리주의 모범을 보여주시는 겁니다. 실은 15년 전에 전신합복자 탈북자와 같은 북한 인권 문제를 가지고 시민운동의 불씨를 지필 때 어느 누구도 그러한 노력이 성공할 것이라고 장담하지 못했었습니다. 목표 달성이 어렵다고 포기했더라면 어떻게 되었겠습니까? 아무도 지금과 같은 진전은 어려웠을 것입니다. 물론 아직도 넘어야 할 산은 높습니다. 2003년부터 유엔인권위원회, 그것이 나중에 인권이사회가 됐고 그리고 유엔총회에서 북한인권결의안이 지금까지 지속적으로 채택되었습니다. 2013년에는 북한인권교사위원회 어, COI를 구성해서 마이클 커비, 마르수피 다루스만, 소니아 비세르코 조사위원이 1년간의 작업 끝에 보고서를 제출하였습니다. 북한 정권이 체계적이고 광범위하며 중대한 인권 침해를 자행하고 있으며 강제수용소, 살인, 고문, 구금을 포함해서 전반적인 반인도 범죄가 일어나고 있다고 판단하였습니다. 1990년대에 굶주리는 주민의 식량권을 침해한 것도 반 인도 범죄였다고 보고 조직적으로 납치하여 송환시키지 않은 사람들에게 반인도 범죄를 저지르고 있다고 판단하였습니다. 과거에 저질렀습니다만 지금도 보내지 않는 것은 현재 진행형의 반인도 범죄에 해당하는 것입니다. COI 보고서의 건의대로 작년 유엔총회는 북한의 책임 있는 당국자를 국제 
형사재판소에 회부하도록 UN 안전보장이사회에 요청을 하였습니다. 안전보장이사회는 이 문제를 의제에 포함시켜 3년간 토의하게 되었습니다. 한국 사회의 인권 인식이 발전 인권 인식의 발전에 비하면 유엔을 중심으로 하는 국제 사회의 움직임은 상상을 초월하고 있습니다. 2005년 밀레니엄 유엔 총회에서 국가의 보호 책임 Responsibility to Protect 라는 개념을 도입하였습니다. 북한 정권이 주민들의 인권을 보호할 책임을 다하지 않는다면 국제사회가 대신하겠다는 인식이 진화되고 있습니다. 오늘 2015 KWAFU 전환기정의 국제회의는 북한 당국자의 반인도 범죄를 추궁하는 유엔 중심의 활동에 기여하고 이를 통해서 6.25 전쟁 중, 정전 중 납치된 민간인 문제를 해결하려고 하는 것입니다. 한국 사회의 시민단체가 포기하지 않고 노력해 나아가면 국제사회의 시민단체들의 협력을 얻게 되고 이것은 유엔을 중심으로 하는 정치적인 그리고 법적인 효과를 갖는 그러한 그 길을 열게 되는 것입니다. 지금의 북한 상황은 어떤 일이 일어난다 하더라도 이상하지 않다고 생각을 합니다. 동유럽의 선례처럼 일단 일이 터진 다음에 정의 실현을 위한 조치들을 시작한다면 너무 늦습니다. 한반도의 전환기 정의 문제는 훨씬 앞서서 준비하는 것이 바람직합니다. 인권보호 증진 차원에서 뿐만 아니라 평화적인 통일을 확보하기 위해서도 그러합니다. 참석자 여러분, 오늘 우리는 납치로 인한 불해, 불행한 사태를 해결하기 위한 현장 활동의 중심에 서 있습니다. 한반도의 인권 문제 해결의 길을 여는 것입니다. 세계 인권의 역사에서 새로운 장을 써가고 있습니다. 남북 통일이 되었을 때 남과 북의 주민이 모두가 인권과 기본적 자유를 향유할 수 있도록 기초를 쌓아가는 것입니다. 이러한 우리들의 노력에 정치권도 동참해 주기를 기대합니다. 10년 이상 방치되고 있는 북한 인권법을 통과시킴으로써 대한민국 정치인들의 민주투사라는 주장을 증명하게 해야 합니다. 끝으로 6.25전쟁 납북가족협의회 이미 이사장님 그리고 여기 참석하신 회원 여러분의 대승적인 활동 그리고 그 안에 녹아있는 고통과 노고에 대해 깊은 경의를 표합니다. 감사합니다. 우선 오늘 발표하실 네 분의 그 발표자와 토론자를 소개해 드리겠습니다. 첫 번째 여러분들 뉴스에서 많이 보셨지만 첫 번째 발표하실 쿠슈트린 팔로시 변호사님은 먼저 소개해 드립니다. 코스보의 인권 변호사이십니다. 코스보 프리슈트리나 어, 크리스티, 크리스티나 대학 법학부에서 어, 법학 학사를 취득했고 코소보 지방자치개혁에 참여했으며 어, 어, 코소보의 발칸반도 어, 조사보고 프로젝트 담당자로서 어, 활동을 했고 
어, 법률 연구에 대한 우수성으로 코소보 공화국 법무부가 수여하는 사회 정의상을 받은 바가 있습니다. 박수로 환영해 주십시오. 두 번째 발표하실 분은 곤살레 과테말라에서 오신 변호사신데 크리스찬 곤살레스 변호사입니다. 이분은 과테말라 법대에서 우등으로 법학 학위를 수여 받았고 2007년에 이후로 과테말라 지역 공동체에게 법률 서비스를 이용 증진하기 위해서 여러 NGO 단체에서 상담 활동을 했으며 엑스클라마 아, 이거 NGO인데요. 부회장 겸 공동 창설자로서 지역 공동체의 지속 가능 개발을 위해서 여러 프로젝트를 진행하고 있습니다. 2008년 이후에 워싱턴에 있는 미주 인권 시스템의 소송 컨설턴트로 어, 일해오고 있습니다. 박수로 환영해 주십시오. 그 다음에 토론에 참, 참가하실 두 분입니다. 어, 먼저 데빗 어, 먼디 교수이십니다. 어, 지금 현재 에, 한동대 에, 국제법률대학원 교수로 어, 재직하고 있는데 그 전에 에, 그 먼디 교수는 전 세계 종교 자유에 초점을 맞춘 어, 국제기구인 에, 주빌리 캠페인에서 어, 홍보 및 커뮤니케이션 책임, 책임자로 어, 일했고 그 후에 워싱턴에 있는 연방사법부에서 일했습니다. 그러한 경험을 바탕으로 미국 국회에서 종교자유를 위한 법률가로 일해, 일하면서 아시아 전역에 걸친 법률 실태조사와 함께 의회 국회의원과 지도자 사이의 법률 개선을 위한 운동을 벌였습니다. 먼디 교수는 종교자유와 인권에 대한 저자이자 자유 기고가로 활동하고 있습니다. 먼저 요새는 위전트 대학에서 공공정책으로 석사 학위를 받았고 어, JD를 받았습니다. 어, 박수로 환영해 주십시오. 그 다음에 미국 변호사이신 강병모 어, 어, 변호사를 소개해 드리겠습니다. 어, 강병모 변호사님은 변환, 전환기 정의 워킹그룹의 연구원으로서 지금 워싱턴 DC에서 활발하게 활동을 하고 계십니다. 박수로 환영해 주십시오. 그럼 먼저 팔로시 변호사님께서 제네바 협약에서 민간인 보호에 관한 조항의 진화에 관해서 한 15분 내 20분 정도 발표하도록 부탁을 드리겠습니다. 감사합니다. 이제니바 First and the second, uh, I would like to speak on the experience of the Balkans and the conflict that happened there and how we dealt with, uh, with the uh, effects of war and what happened to our families and to, to the civilian populations in the countries of Balkans. Uh, first, the four Geneva Conventions were created out of necessity. Namely, to protect first uh, those involved in war uh, who were no longer fighting each other. Basically, the wounded, the sick, uh, the prisoners of war, and uh, civilians. And 
the Geneva Convention's primary role is to protect people. So it's not intended to uh, bring justice or to hold people accountable. It's to protect them. And uh, in case they are uh, violated, then uh, people should be held accountable by other, uh, other means of law. Uh, before Geneva Convention and Protocol 1 and Protocol 2 of the Geneva Convention deal specifically with the protections afforded to civilians during the conflict, with, uh, to the civilians during uh, which find themselves between uh, two uh, waging war uh, countries or two waging war parties. Further, the International Criminal Court seeks to hold those responsible for violations of the Geneva Conventions and the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court uh, to account. It seeks to deliver justice. However, as we shall see, the International Criminal Court has limitations because it cannot go backwards and look at situations which happened before it came into force. The protections afforded by the Geneva Conventions and the uh, principles that uh, are contained therein are principles of customary international law, which means that they apply towards all nations. And no country can say uh, they don't apply because they haven't uh, ratified the Geneva Conventions. They apply to, towards all people and towards all nations because they've been accepted and they've been embraced as such by the international community as a whole. Uh, as we said, the fourth Geneva Convention applies in cases of declared war, armed conflict between members of the Geneva Convention, or cases of total or partial occupation of a member state. Uh, the, Geneva, the four Geneva Conventions specifically deals with the protections of civilians, and it contains general and specific protections that are uh, afforded to civilians during an armed conflict and during a war. It also applies in uh, cases of internal conflict occurring in the territory of a member state. So if one state hasn't ratified the Geneva Convention, but at the same time is involved in a conflict in a territory of a member state, then uh, the Geneva Convention applies towards that state as well. The protected persons are basically those who find themselves in the hands of the enemy or of a party to which they are not national. What this means is that uh, the civilians that are not taking part actively in the uh, fightings or in the, in the conflict, they are afforded protection. And uh, of course, they, can, they, they should not be protected by their own country because their own country doesn't fight them. But they should be protected against the other countries or uh, the enemy forces that are fighting uh, the country of the nationals. The protections apply to all civilian population without discrimination. So no discrimination based on national origin, race, uh, uh, religion, or belief can be uh, imposed on the application of the protections of the Geneva Convention. What are the nature uh, of the protections afforded to civilians? First, the civilians not taking part in the war must be treated humanely and without distinction based on race, uh, nation, uh, religion, sex, and other similar criteria. So, uh, the first protection is humane treatment of uh, the civilians. They cannot be treated as, uh, as belligerent parties, they cannot be treated as uh, enemy force, they cannot be treated as a military force is treated. They should be treated as human and humanely uh, by the enemy forces. Parties to a war are prohibited from using at least the following acts towards civilians. They should not use violence or the threat of violence. They should not uh, murder civilians. Uh, they cannot murder civilians. They should not use cruel treatment, torture, uh, inhumane and degrading treatment. They cannot take hostages, uh, the civilian, the civilian uh, population. They cannot humiliate and degrade uh, the civilian population. They cannot uh, uh, use extrajudicial killings 
and sentences without trial. The protocol warned to the Geneva Convention further details and highlights the protections already afforded by the, by the fourth Geneva Convention. Uh, similarly, it states that uh, the following acts cannot be used towards civilians or uh, violence to the life, health, or physical or mental well-being of persons, and in particular, the acts such as murder, torture, torture of all kinds, corporal punishment and mutilation, humiliating and degrading treatment, and forced prostitution, and any form of indecent assault, the taking of hostages, collective punishment. As we see throughout the time, the Fourth Geneva Convention uh, provides only general protections or highlights just some forms of acts which are prohibited from uh, commission towards civilian population. As we go along the development in time, the first protocol and the second protocol details in even more uh, acts that are prohibited. Further, and uh, customary international law uh, further includes other acts which are not, not specifically contained in the Geneva Convention or the, its protocols that are prohibited from uh, commission. The second protocol to Geneva Convention states that civilian population shall enjoy general protection against the dangers arising from military operations. This is a general uh, protection, namely it's a general principle which uh, doesn't need to be detailed because uh, it is understood that the parties already know that they cannot attack and they cannot target civilians. Civilians further shall not be object of attack. Acts or threats of violence and the primary purpose of which is to spread terror among the civilian population are prohibited. Civilians enjoy the protections at all times, until and unless they don't become part of the hostilities between the parties involved. So, no state can claim that uh, the protection uh, stop or they can derogate from a certain period of the conflict. Namely, they apply at all times. And uh, until the civilians are not taking part actively in the shootings or actively in the hostility, they are under the protections of the Geneva Convention. The means to enforce uh, the Geneva Conventions or uh, the protections, uh, to enforce the protections contained therein, are various. Uh, first, according to the Fort Geneva Convention, the belligerent parties can establish neutralized zones, agree to a neutralized zone where civilians, uh, institutions, uh, civilian objects or services such as hospitals and centers uh, are contained and which both parties to that conflict agree they will not target, they will not uh, attack on those uh, neutralized zones. Further, uh, hospitalized hospitals and, uh, and uh, civilian objects are protected from, uh, from targeting and from the military operations in a conflict. As we said, uh, the Geneva Conventions and the International uh, Committee of the Red Cross has concluded and the international community has uh, embraced the, the Geneva Conventions as customary international law, which means countries cannot claim they haven't ratified the Geneva Conventions. Countries are obliged to observe the principles and the, uh, the rules contained in the Geneva Convention and the rules that have been embraced as such by the international community. Customary international law is created out of a widespread state practice and behavior based on a feel of obligation to behave in such a way. Uh, throughout history and throughout time, the states have uh, acted in a way that they have uh, created rules and uh, forms of behavior that intended to protect civilians and that practice of state, that behavior of state has become a rule which then applies towards all nations and towards all states and even in case let's say North Korea or some other country claim that the Geneva Conventions and the protections that contained therein are and applied towards them because they haven't ratified 
uh, those conventions. By customary international law, they are obliged to observe those rules, and they they will be held accountable the same as if they were uh, as if they had ratified the Geneva Convention. Customary international law applies to all states and prohibits the following acts on all states, namely murder, torture, cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, corporal punishment and mutilation, rape and other forms of sexual violence, slavery, forced labor, hostage taking, and human shields, enforced disappearances, deprivation of liber liberty, collective punishment, and fair trial guarantees. As we saw, the four Geneva Conventions didn't contain the word forced disappearance as such. Uh, however, the nations and the states have recognized it as a rule of customary international law, which means the, all countries committing enforced disappearance, uh, those responsible within those countries can be held accountable. And they are indeed committing war crimes and uh, crimes against humanity, as we shall see uh, in the Balkans case. The Rome Statute of International Criminal Court established the International Criminal Court which seeks to hold accountable persons for violations of the Rome Statute and commission of crimes contained in the Rome Statute, namely for genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes and aggression. The Rome Statute entered into force in 2002 and by its provision the International Criminal Court can have jurisdiction only from the events that took place from 2002 and on. So, uh, even in the case of the Balkans and in the case of North Korea, International Criminal Court cannot have jurisdiction for events that took place in the 50s or the 60s. However, they can have jurisdiction for an ongoing violation, which uh, which uh, which I'm sure other uh, other speakers will will address. The definition contained in the Rome Statute about crimes against humanity says that the following acts, when committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population, uh, intrigue. Uh, trigger the international responsibility, criminal responsibility of the perpetrators. Namely, murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, imprisonment, torture, rape and other sexual violence, uh, persecution based on political, racial, national or ethnic origin, enforced disappearance of persons, and the crime of apartheid. As we see, the Rome Statute contains the enforced disappearances as a crime uh, against humanity. Now we turn uh, to the conflict in the Balkans and uh, our experiences uh, with justice there. First, the conflict and the wars in the Balkans occurred in the 90s and as a result of the violent dissolution of uh, former Yugoslavia. There were a series of wars or armed conflict which were fought by uh, by uh, particular uh, parties. First, in 1991, uh, Serbia and Slovenia fought a short war which followed the declaration of independence by Slovenia. Between 1991 and 1995, Serbia and Croatia uh, fought each other as a result of the dissolution. And then Serbs mainly the ethnic groups of Serbs, uh, Croatians, uh, and Bosniaks, all supported by their respective countries, uh, fought in Bosnia and Herzegovina between 1992 and 1995. And Serbia and ethnic Albanians fought in Kosovo between 1998 and 1999, as well as Macedonia and ethnic Albanians in 2001. The conflict, the war in the Balkans resulted in more than 130,000 people uh, dead, the majority of which were civilians. More than 12,000 people are still missing. Uh, more than 2,000 are missing in Kosovo and more than 10,000 are missing in, the, in Bosnia and elsewhere. The Balkans focus more on justice uh, rather than, uh, than uh, transitional justice and reconciliation. Uh, in a case tried by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, 
called uh, Kurpash's case, the ICTY recognized the importance of appearance as a grind against humanity and held responsible the leadership of the military for uh, enforced disappearances of persons and forced deportations of people. They concluded that it was considered as an inhumane act and it was recognized by customary international law. Further, courts in national uh, countries, such as in Bosnia, recognized enforced disappearances as a crime against humanity. And they concluded it was recognized by customary international law. That way, they said uh, specifically that even though the word enforced disappearance isn't contained in the Geneva Conventions, the practice of states and the, uh, and the agreements of, between the states recognized uh, that it was a crime against humanity. They even make reference to the uh, Inter-American uh, Conventions Against Enforced Disappearances. That's how I conclude my uh, presentations. And uh, the international humanitarian law already contains rules that uh, recognize enforced disappearances as a war crime and as a crime against humanity. And uh, there are means to hold accountable and to deliver justice to the families of the victims. Thank you. No. え、感謝합니다。え、基本的に、え、発表を했었는데요。え、잠깐、こう、言える、え、はき、え、その、과거의、この、国家、法律、を、進める、この、法律、を、判断、を、え、そう、安置、を、を、を、を、を、を、を、
first I would like to thank the, the Korean Abductive Family Union and the National Committee on Investigating Abductions during the Korean War for this invitation. So uh, I currently work at the Inter-American Human Rights Commission, which is a body of the Organization of American States that, among other functions, uh, monitors compliance with the with treaties such as the American Convention and the Inter-American Convention on Forced Disappearance of Persons. So I would like um, to provide an overview of the most relevant development on the prohibition of forced disappearances in international law. And uh, in order to do that, I will first uh, briefly talk about the origin of the phenomenon and its actuality, and then I will describe the advances provided in international human rights law in international criminal law and in international humanitarian law, um, pointing out to the differences of the rules prohibiting the enforced disappearance uh, in each international system. So as to the, the context, we could say that the origin of, the, of these uh, practices uh, dates back to the National Socialism in Germany. Uh, through the night and fog decree of December 7, 1941, Adolf Hitler ordered the arrest of persons situated in occupied territories who endangered German security. As, and as a consequence, these people were transported to Germany where they disappeared. Officials were forbidden to provide any information on the arrested persons or its whereabouts in order to increase the intimidation of the necks of kin and society as a whole. And for this appearance was also a practice between the 1960s and 1980s uh, in, uh, in throughout Latin America um, as part of their counterinsurgency campaigns in order to systematically intimidate and repress the opposition. It also happened in other regions of the world, as you may be aware. The report of the Commission on Inquiry on Human Rights in the Democratic Republic of Korea established that since 1950, uh, North Korea engaged in the systematic and massive scale abduction and subsequent enforced disappearance of persons from other countries on a large scale as a matter of state policy. Well over 200,000 people, including children, were brought from other countries to Korea and may have become victims of enforced disappearance. In addition, and unfortunately, the enforced disappearance is not an issue of the past. Both the Inter-American Commission and the UN Working Group have acknowledged that enforced disappearances continue to occur in the era of democratic governments and have pointed out on the metamorphosis of the phenomena. While it used to be part of the national security strategies against so-called uh, subversive of terrorist groups, it's now taking place in other contexts such as drug cartels and human trafficking organizations in collaboration with state agents. Uh, in Mexico, for instance, on December 26, 2000, on September. 26, 2014, a group of 43 students of the Teachers College of Ayotzinapa in the Mexican state of Guerrero were disappeared by alleged members of the police and armed commandos. Uh, on February 13, 2015, the UN Committee on Enforced Disappearances delivered a review of the shortcomings and it described the situation as widespread across much of Mexico. So I would like now to um, provide an overview on the development in, the, in international human rights law, first uh, in the UN system. Um, so in the UN system, uh, there are three main instruments to prevent the practice of four disappearances. The resolution 33173, the UN declaration on the protection of all persons from four disappearances, and the International Convention for the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearance. 
the resolution 33173 was adopted in 1978, in which uh, the General Assembly expressed its concern on the report on various parts of the world relating to enforced disappearances as a result of excesses on the part of law enforcement or security authorities while detention. Um, a couple of years later, in December 12, 1992, the UN adopted the Declaration on the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearances. This uh, declaration is monitored by the Working Group on Enforced or Involuntary Disappearances, uh, which is the first thematic mechanism established with the universal mandate in the UN. And uh, the working group can examine individual petitions and cases of enforced disappearances, which are transmitted to the state, concerned through the most rapid means possible. Uh, so the most important aspects of this declaration, the first one is that it contains the first, in its preamble, it contains the first definition of enforced disappearance, understood as the arrest, detention, or abduction of persons against their will, or order the privation of liberty by officials of different branches of levels of the government, or by organized groups or private individuals acting on behalf, or with the support, direct or indirect consent, or acquiescence of the government, followed by a refusal to disclose the fate or whereabouts of the persons concerned, or a refusal to acknowledge the deprivation of liberty. The working group considers the enforced disappearance of persons as a multiple violation of rights, such as the right to recognition as a person before the law, the right to liberty and security of the person, and the right not to be subject to torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment, as well as the right to life. It's uh, important to underscore that the, currently the working group is exploring the impact on enforced disappearances on economic, social, and cultural rights, because it considers that uh, most the, the people who lack those rights are the most vulnerable, vulnerable to be subject to enforced disappearances. It, the working group also considers the enforced disappearance of persons as a continuous offense, as long as the perpetrators continue to conceal their fate and the whereabouts of the victims. Uh, this means that even if some aspects of the violation may have been completed before the entry into force of this instrument, if other parts of the violation are still continuing, the matter should be heard and the act should not be fragmented. Therefore, states are responsible for enforced disappearances even if they took place before the entry of the the entry into force. Um, no, so, so not only for violations that occur after the entry into force of the instrument. Um, the working group uh, considered that there is a duty to investigate, and no measures can be taken to impede the investigation. This, this means that no amnesties, no amnesties, and no statute of limitation should apply to the enforced disappearances while the crime is still ongoing. It also considers that the enforced disappearance is a crime on the domestic, the, the, the enforced disappearance should be a crime under domestic criminal law. And uh, in order to interpret if uh, enforced disappearance is a crime against humanity, it can apply the provisions on the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Uh, the next relevant instrument is that the UN is the International Convention for the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearance, which entered into force on December 23, 2010. Um, the compliance with the convention is monitored by the Committee on Enforced Disappearances, a body of independent experts, and um, it has um, a more limited uh, competence, given that Article 35 establishes that the, comi the Committee on Enforced Disappearances should have com competence solely in respect on enforced disappearance when commen which commences after the entry into force of this convention. Um, 
given this limitation, the Council of Europe, for example, has considered to uh, the creation of a separate European Convention and for disappearances. It's uh, also relevant to point out that uh, Article 3 of this convention establishes the duty of the states not only to investigate and force disappearances committed by states, but the act of disappearances committed by non-state actors. Uh, in addition, it's Article 8 establishes that statute of limitations in respect of force disappearances uh, should take the necessary measures to ensure that the term of limitation for criminal proceedings is of long duration and proportionate to extreme seriousness of the offense and should commence from the moment when the offense of enforced disappearances ceases, taking into account its continuous nature. So this means that until the fate and whereabouts of the victims are, are uh, unknown, a state cannot apply a statute of limitations for uh, uh, the crime of enforced disappearance. I would like now to talk about the enforced disappearances uh, within the Inter-American human rights system. So the Inter-American system is uh, formed by two organs, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and the Inter-American Court on Human Rights. Both are part of the Organization of American States. Um, the Inter-American Commission has an individual petition system which processes individual complaints against states for violations of the rights protected in the American Convention as well as the Inter-American Convention of Enforced Disappearances among other instruments. Um, the Inter-American Convention on Enforced Disappearance of Persons is the first international convention to define enforced disappearances. Um, as the act of depriving a person or person of his freedom in whatever way, by state agents or by persons of group of persons acting with the authorization, support, or acquiescence of the state, followed by an absence of information or a refusal to acknowledge that deprivation of freedom. Uh, Article 3 establishes that uh, state parties must... Uh, define for disappearance of persons as an offense and to impose an appropriate punishment uh, commensurate with its extreme gravity. And it also continues that the, it also considers that an offense has a continuous or permanent nature until the fate or the whereabouts of the victims are determined. The, I would like to describe the most important case law of the Inter-American system. Um, similarly to the, to the uh, UN declaration, the Inter-American court considers that enforced disappearances have a multi-offensive nature that violates the right to juridical personality, the right to life, the right to humane treatment, and the right to personal liberty. Also, the lack of investigation violates the right to a fair trial and the right to uh, judicial protection. Uh, a relevant aspect is that in a case against Guatemala, in the Chitai case versus Guatemala, the court also declared the violation of the political rights of the victim, given that due to his forced disappearance, configured as a selective disappearance, he was deprived of the exercise of the right to political participation in representation of his community. So the court considered that because the victim was not able, this, uh, he was a communitarian leader, he was not able to exercise his political rights, or uh, the enforced disappearance was a consequence of him uh, exercising uh, political leadership within, within his community, this enforced disappearance violated the, 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 the political rights. Um, it considers the enforced disappearance as a continuing crime, and in instances in which states have questioned the temporal com competence of the court, because the commencement of the facts occurred before the date on which the treaty entered into force, the court has determined that it's competent to examine the cases given that enforced disappearances 
continued after the treaty entry, entry into force. Uh, the Inter-American Commission has also established that one state authorities became aware of the alleged facts of foreign force disappearances, they must open an investigation without delay, which must be serious, impartial, and effective through all legal means available, and aim at determining the truth and at prosecuting, offending, trying, and punishing all the per perpetrators, especially when state agents are or may be involved. It considers that when enforced disappearance is committed as a systematic practice, it constitutes a crime against humanity. As uh, the Inter-American Court has been very creative when applying uh, reparations for the victims, and it has applied measures of rehabilitation, satisfaction, and guarantees of non-repetition, such as medical and psychological care for the victims, uh, public acts to acknowledge the international responsibility of the state, as well as the adoption of domestic legal provisions to ensure effective investigation of enforced disappearance. Uh, next, I would like to uh, explore the prohibition and enforced disappearances within the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, the European Court is uh, an international court established in 1959, and it rules on the individual state application, uh, applications alleging violations of the rights set out in the European Convention. Uh, according to its case law, the enforced disappearance is also a multi-offensive uh, violation of rights, which violates the right to life in its substantive and uh, procedural dimension. It, by, it constitutes a violation of the provision of torture, the right to liberty and security, and the right to an effective remedy. It has a, a more restrictive approach when the term is temporal jurisdiction. Uh, so it considers one that where the death occurred before the entry into force of the treaty, only procedural acts and omissions occurring after that date can fall within the court's temporal jurisdiction. The court ca has also applied a presumption of death of the victim uh, if, uh, if uh, it may have occurred before the entry into force of the treaty. This means that they, they can um, they consider the case, but not with regards to violation of the right to life. In, uh, in international criminal law, uh, I, I, I want to point out to the most important rules uh, next. Uh, in the, particularly in the Rome Statute, uh, enforced disappearance is a, crime, is a crime against humanity when it's committed in a widespread or systematic way. This means that uh, if it's the manifestation of a uh, policy or plan of violence created by state authorities, um, leading officials of a de facto state-like organization or an organized political group. It is widespread if it's a single crime, if the single crime is the instance of a repetition of similar crimes or part of a string of such crimes. A relevant aspect to point out is that uh, according to the statute, not only states or people acting on behalf of states can commit them for disappearances, but also political organizations. And finally, it falls on the jurisdiction of the ICC if the uh, crimes against humanity of enforced disappearance of persons occur after the entry into force of the treaty. In international criminal law, in international humanitarian law, as it was pointed out before, it's a uh, uh, rule of customary international law. And it's also worth uh, pointing out that it violates the right to, the, the families have the right to truth, according to Article 32 of the protocol, which establishes the right of families to know the fate of their disappeared relative. Um, so, uh, 
Um, after pointing out these differences, I would like to uh, recall that the most important factor encouraging the persistence of forced disappearance is the impunity. Uh, so it's important that states adopt uh, domestic legislation to uh, uh, prevent enforced disappearance of persons and to prosecute uh, people that may be involved in the in the in the act of enforced disappearance of persons. There is a a saying in Latin America. Uh, uh, they took them alive, and alive we want them back. Thank you very much. We claim that our governments are free and better than previous governments or previous systems because they are based on democracy or based on social compact based on past practices and customs, or based on equality and individual rights. What is more fundamental to individual rights than enforced disappearances? As Attorney Pellucci and Attorney uh, Chacon proved at length in their papers, this really is a crime against humanity that demands justice. Yet, we have some difficulty. We find ourselves in modern states that are indeed collective of individual rights, a collection of individuals who stand in direct relation to the state, Yet, ironically, individuals have less protection. If we stand alone as individuals in relation to the state, then who will stand up for us and make sure our rights are secured? That's why it's very important that civil society organizations like the Adoptees Family Union persevere in the struggle and stand together. We seem to live in weak and timorous states to which we've given nearly every human freedom to our governments in return for safety and yet we are not safe. We are not safe from rogue actors who are still disappearing people from South Korea. When a fisherman goes out on his boat, will he be safe? We are not safe. As Attorney uh, Chacon pointed out, we are not safe from non-state actors. It's a difficult situation. Or worse, there are people who live in states and governments who actively use enforced disappearances as a strategy against the civilian population to maintain government power. So what can we do? We were all young once. We all grew up on the playground. What can we do when confronted by some bully? Here in this panel, we appeal to higher power, to international law. And we see in these papers two good examples of the International Criminal Tribunal in Yugoslavia and of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and what they have done to combat this serious issue. But also, as humans, we appeal to a higher authority. 
the one who establishes all of our rights and duties. The one who says captives ought to be returned, and not only be returned, but be restored in better condition than when they left. Attorney Chacon points out the importance of reparations in his papers, of taking people out of slavery and then reestablishing them in a better situation, a better condition than they were, because it's the right thing to do. We all know it. It's the just and right thing to do. And you don't need Geneva Convention to tell you what the right thing is. We know what the right thing is. But of course, how can we establish that right thing through international and through domestic law? And these two papers have been significant contributions in that direction, in thinking how in the Korean Peninsula situation can we deal with the situation moving forward. However, I want to point out a few things here. In Attorney Chacon's paper, he's absolutely right that the question of timing is very important. If a tribunal is established to deal with a situation in the Korean Peninsula, will that tribunal be able to take jurisdiction, to take power over the crimes that happened in the past? And he rightly pointed out two ways of going. Either the Amer uh, inter-American courts path recognizing this as a continuous violation, not something that took place once a long time ago, but an ongoing violation of rights, not only of the abductee, but of the families as well. He also pointed out the European Court of Human Rights takes a little bit of a different approach. I think we would recommend that in the Korean Peninsula situation, the authorities really look at the inter-American courts model and adopt that model as regards temporal jurisdiction. As Attorney Pelushi pointed out, I have a, the, a point on Attorney Pelushi's paper. Uh, it seems that enforced disappearances are only a crime against humanity in certain contexts. That is, if the scale of the crime matches the severity of other crimes against humanity. And so I think we need to do some work and build up proof, as you've been doing, that this was systematic, widespread, part of a government policy to advance the interests of a government in wartime. And so I think other presenters in the afternoon will advance the state of knowledge on this subject so that we can build a legal proof that this is indeed a crime against humanity. Attorney Chacon and Attorney Pelushi provide the legal framework, but of course it will be up to you and up to us to add the key facts into those legal frameworks to prove up the legal rule. And then finally, finally, you know, well, I, I, I suppose my, my time is about, is about up. I, I'll stop there. But I just want to point out, you know, these are, are legal papers and, you know, very, very interesting. But really what they do is they, they point to, to justice and they help build that bridge to justice in thinking about how can we approach important topics. How can those topics be addressed, especially for the, the, the timing, the temporal issue? I wondered myself, how will that be dealt with? Will the, will, in, in establishing a tribunal, would the rules of the tribunal establish that? Or would it have to be done by the court's decision determining its own jurisdiction as other courts have, have done in the inter-American uh, context and in the European Court of Human Rights context? So these are very important questions, interesting questions that have been pointed out. And I thank the attorneys for their contribution to the state of art and to the knowledge, uh, uh, legal knowledge here in, uh, the, in the Korean situation. So thank you.
한일 관계도 어, 그, 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 네, 강경모라고 합니다. 어, 두분그 발제 잘 들었고요. 먼디 교수님께서도 코멘트를 하셨는데 어, 저도 그이 강제납치 문제가 가지고 있는 그 법률적으로 가지고 있는 계속적 형격의 문제에 대해서 간단하게 코멘트를 좀 하려고 합니다. 음, 우리가 우리나라에서 이제 북한 인권 문제를 얘기할 때 항상 거의 대부분의 경우 얘기를 하는 전제가 ICC 제소를 전제로 해서 이제 얘기를 하는 경향이 좀 있는데요. 근데 강제 납치 문제가 가지는 특징 중에 제일 중요한 것이 아까 계속해서 말씀하신 것처럼 계속범적인 특정이 좀 있습니다. 근데 이 계속범적인, 계속범의 특성이 ICC, 그 강제 납치 문제를 ICC에서 제소를 함에 있어서 굉장히 중요한 쟁점이 되는 측면이 좀 있습니다. 음, 그럼 강제 납, 시 문제가 가지고 있는 계속, 계속적인 성격이 무엇이냐 여기서 말씀을 드리면 그 ICC 규정, 그러니까 로마 규정 제 7조 1항에서 보면은 그 강제 납치가 인도의 반환죄에 해당이 포함이 되는데 거기에 따르면 강제 실종, 강제 납치는 그 국가나 정치 집단의 직간접적인 행위로 인해서 사람들의 체포, 구금 혹은 유괴가 이루어진 이후에 피해자에 대한 자유를 박탈했다는 그 사실을 부인하고 혹은 이제 그 피해자에 대한 행방에 대한 정보를 제공을 거절하는 것 이것이 이제 어 로마 규정에서 말하는 강제 납치, 강제 실종에 관한 핵심적인 내용입니다. 그러니까 로마 규정상에서는 강제 실종 문제가 크게 둘로 구분이 됩니다. 첫째는 피해자를 이제 체포 구금하는 그 즉시범적인 행위가 있고 그 다음에 그 피해자가 어디에 있는지 행방의 운명에 대한 내용을 확인해 주지 않는 것으로 이제 구성이 되는데요. 어, 아까 두분 변호사님께서 이제 발표하신 것처럼 그 국제 조약이나 국제 기구에서 이 강제 실종 강제 압치 문제를 적용할 때그이 대속범의 특성을 어떻게 적용하는지가 좀 접근하는 게좀 다릅니다. 말씀하신 것처럼 음, 유엔 강제 실종 작업반이나 뭐 미주 인권 재판소 같은 경우에는 시간적 관할 이전에 발생한 강제 실종 납치 문제에 있어서도 그 관할을 인정하는 경향, 인정을 하지만 반대로 유럽 같은 경우에선 또 그렇지 않은 경우가 있고요. 그렇다면 ICC에서는 그 시적 관할을 어떻게 적용하고 있느냐. 말씀하신 것처럼 11조 1항에서는, 어, 2002년 7월 1월, 7월 1일 이후에 발생한 범죄 안에서 관할권을 가집니다. 아, 어, 그런데 그 로마 기정 24조 1항에서는, 어, 소급 적용에 대한 내용을 규정하고 있는데요. 거기서는 로마 규정이 발효되기 이전, 그러니까 2002년 7월 이후 이전의 행위에 대해서 로마 규정의 적, 소급 적용을 금지한다 이렇게 되어 있습니다. 그 근데 관할에 대한 내용이나 소급 적용에 대한 내용에 대해서는 로마 규정에 다 저, 저, 그 규정이 있는데 이 계속범을 어떻게 해결할 것인지에 대해서는 로마 규정상의 명문의 규정이 없습니다. 단지 아까 말씀드린 것처럼 21조, 아, 24조 1항에서 소급 적용 금지의 대상은 로마 규정 발효일 이전의 행위라고만 규정이 어, 행위에 대해서는 소급 적용을 하지 않는다고 되어 있는데 어, 여기서 중요한 건이 워딩이 행위라고 컨덕트라고 되어 있는 것이 좀 중요합니다. 무슨 말이냐면 이제 로마 어, 그 조약 발효 이전에 발생했거나 행해졌거나 완성이 됐거나 한 행위에 대해서 소급 적용한다는 것이 아니고 단순하게 그 2002년 7월 1일 이전에 발생한 행위에 대해서는 소급 적용하지 않는다고 되어 있기 때문에 해석학에 따라서는 이것을 어, ICC가 그 계속범에 대해서 2002년 7월 1일 이전에 발생한 사건에 대해서 계속범적 성격을 가지고 있을 때그 문제 그 문제에 대해서 관할을 가지고 있다라고 해석하는 주장도 있습니다. 근데 이런 주장이 가지고 있는 문제가 뭐냐면 관할에 관한 그 규정 11조 1항의 관할에 관한 내용에 대해서는 명확하게 행해 범해진 범죄 크라임이라고 되어 있기 때문에. 사실 이런 해석도 좀 어렵지 않을까 싶긴 하고요. 또 판례에 대해 판례도 나온 게 없습니다. ICC가 지금까지 나왔던 판례 중에서 이 계속범을 계속범에 대해서 
2002년 7월 1일, 1일 이전에 발생한 범죄에 대해서 그것이 가지고 있는 계속적 성격에도 불구하고 이, 문제, 이 문제를 ICC가 해결할 수 있느냐, 수사할 수 있느냐에 대해서 이것을 해석한 판례가 없습니다. 다만 우리가 참고할 수 있는 부분이 루반가 사건이라는 게 있는데요. 콩고 내전에서 소년범, 그러니까 15세 이하의 소년범을 병사로 징집해서 전투행에 동원했던 그 사건에서 ICC의 전신재판부가 어, 소년범이 15세가 이르기 전, 이를 때까지 그 범죄 행위가, 소년범의 범죄 행위가 지속되고 있는 것이다. 라고 해서 이제 그 소년범, 사, 소년범의 그 범죄에 대해서는 대속범의 성질을 인정을 했습니다. 근데 문제는 여기서 그 전신재판부에서 인정했던 이 사건에 대해서는 이 소년범 사건은 2002년 7월 1일 이후에 발생했던 소년범 사건입니다. 그렇기 때문에 이 전신재판부가 가지, 그, 이 결정을 가지고 ICC가 강제 납치의 문제에 대해서 7월 2002년 이전에 발생했던 강제 납치 사건에 대해서 관할권을 가질 수 있다 생각한 것이냐라고 본다면 그것은 틀린 것이고요. 단지 여기서 이, 이 루방가 사건이 가지고 있는 의미는, 어, ICC가 어떤 특정 사건에 대해서 성, 그 성질을 보고 그 사건이 지속, 현재 지속 중인 사건이다라는 것을, 어, 인정했다. 이 정도 차원에서 좀 해석을 하면 될것 같고요. 그러면은, 우리 그 강제 실종, 강제 납치 문제에 대해서 북한에 의해서 벌어진 강제 실종, 강제 납치 사건은 모두가 2002년 이전에 발생했던 행위인데, 그럼 여기에 대해서 전혀 대책이 없는가? 라는 문제가 남습니다. 사실은 이 강제 납치 문제 이외에도 여러 가지 북한 인권 문제가 가지고 있는 특징이 2002년 이전에 벌어진 문제이기 때문에, ICC로 가져가는 것에 대해서 기술적으로는 좀 어려운 부분이 분명히 존재합니다. 단지 이제 아, 그 안보리에서 결의안을 통해서 ICC의 회부를 하자나 결의안이 나오면 가능하겠지만 그것은 어떤 뭐 외교적인거나 정치적인 문제로 인해서 좀 어려울 수도 있는데 그러면 이것을 어떻게 해야 될 것이냐 사실 그 ICC의 그 계속범의 문제에서 굉장히 논쟁이 많은데 아. 어, 이 문제를 해결할 수 있는 가장, 뭐랄까요, 어떤 논리를 구성하기에는 좀 어려움이 있지만, 그래도 얘기를 한다면, 계속범적 특성, 그 강제 납치가 계속범적 특성을 가지고 있음에도 불구하고, 단지 관할의 이유 때문에 이 문제를 해결하지, 않, 손등을 대지 않을 경우에는, 정의에 반한다는 것. 그러니까, 이 문제 한에서만큼은 불처벌의 상황을 만들어낸다. 이 문제를 저지른 범죄자들에 대해서 인권유린의 어떤 가해자에 대해서 어떤 처벌을 면제시키는 사실상의 효과를 만들어내기 때문에 그런 음, 사실 부정, 부정이한 그 상황을 만들어낸다는 점에서 좀 뭐랄까요 주장을 해야 한다고 할까요 그렇게 저는 생각을 하고요 근데 이제 아까 말씀드린 것처럼 루방가 사건을 생각해보면 그리고 강제 압식의 문제가 가지고 있는 계속 범적 승질을 인정을 한다면 어, 좀 조심스럽지만 ICC에서도 이 문제에 대해서만큼은 관할을 인정할 수도 있지 않을까라는 어, 생각을 가지고 있습니다. 네, 여기까지 마치겠습니다. 네, 네 감사합니다. 강연적 어, 범죄로서 ICC에서 가지는 그런 가능성 그 논리적인 설명을 네, 해주셨습니다. 어, 그러면은 두분 발표 그리고 어, 두 분의 그, 어, 토론이 되었는데 어, 여기 그 플로어에서 어, 혹시 그 질문이나 이런 어, 그, 말씀하실 분이 계시면 간단하게 말씀해 주시고 그 다음에 그, 그, 그 발표자들이 답변을 그, 받는 어, 그런 방향으로, 방법으로 어, 하고 싶습니다. 혹시 그, 질문하실 분이 있으시면 말씀해 주시고 네. 아, 미안합니다. 아, 알겠습니다. 네, 네. 에, 그, 지금, 어, 발표와 토론이 있었는데, 여기 그, 참, 어, 참석하시는 청중에서, 청중중에서, 혹시 질문이나 말씀하실 수 있으면 간단하게 몇, 어, 몇분 그 말씀하시도록 어, 부탁드리겠습니다. 네. 그럼요, 회의를 수차례, 그, 저, 참석을 해봐도요, 개인의, 그, 저, 보상 문제는 어째 한마디도 언급이 없습니까? 
이거 큰 문제가 있지. 그냥 덮어, 그냥 덮고 넘어가려고 이런 숫자 인지 뭔지 모르겠는데 한마디 없이 얘기했어요. 애인의 보상 문제는 말 한마디 언급도 없고 뭐 이런 나라가 어딨어요, 어디? 사회주의 국가가 인민, 공화국도 이런 국가는 없어요. 이거 좀 답변하세요. 네. 감사합니다. 제가 발표할 때 지금 개인 보상 문제에 대해서 제기적이기 때문에 좀 설명을 해드리겠습니다. 어, 그리고 지금 발표하신 아, 내용 중에서 그 계속성, 계속보험에 대한 그 설명이 굉장히 중요한데 지금 이기호 전쟁 때 발생한 문제를 지금 2015년에 다루고 있지 않습니까? 그래서 저희에게는 이 계속성이라는 것을 인정하는 것이 매우 중요한 주제인데요. 지금 그 곤자레스 변호사님이 발표한 내용 중에서 왜 지금 이주 인권 법원과 그리고 어, 유럽 인권 법원이 그것에 대해서 다른 입장을 취하게 됐는지 혹시 그 이유를 알고 계신지 여쭤보고 싶습니다. 네, 그러면은 어, 지금 어, 해주신 질문을 포함해서 어, 발표하신 두 분이 먼저 그 답변해주세요. 이제는 혼자를 대표해주세요. 먼저 말씀. 오케이, okay, thank you. Um, well, uh, I will be very brief, brief with both questions. As to the reparations part, um, in the within the inter-American system of human rights, the reparations are very, very important. And um, as I mentioned, uh, there has to be guarantees of uh, there has to be justice. Uh, truth uh, and guarantees of non-repetition. Justice is one dimension, which in my experience is the most difficult to comply with. So in, in my experience with litigation of enforced disappearances cases, when, the, when a state is convicted, they usually, in the Americas I mean, they usually acknowledge their international responsibility, they usually pay um, monetary compensation, and they usually adopt a, another set of uh, measures uh, uh, of reparation, but usually the most difficult part is uh, the justice part, because in some instances they have to uh, first uh, change their national legislation and to um, to adopt and force disappearances as a crime sometimes. They don't have enforced disappearance as a, as a crime, and they usually use the abduction crime, for example, which, in our opinion, is not uh, adequate to uh, prosecute someone for this crime. As to the second question of the continuing nature, well, it's, uh, I would say it's, um, the, the, the inter American well, the Jamaican court has had two different uh, views on the continuing nature of the crime. The first um, view was adopted in a case uh, called uh, Eliodoro Portugal. So in that case, the Inter-American court applied a presumption of death of the victim, uh, which is... Uh, so, so it uh, presumed that the victim died before the entry into force of the treaty. Therefore, they could not um, um, they could not rule on the right to life, but they could rule on other articles of the of the convention. And what happened is that the European Court took this case as a as a model to. Um, uh, to determine the continuous the, the continuous nature of the crime, so it's uh, more like a, a fragmented uh, view of the continuity of the crime, uh, different with the inter-American view, with the current inter-American view and the uh, view of the um, war 
working group that, that monitors the compliance with the declaration. So I would say is uh, the the European Court took the approach of the, um, the 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 first approach that the that the Inter American Court took, uh, which the Inter American Court changed later. So that that would be like the like the quick response. Yeah. Hello. Oh. Uh, very shortly, uh, in terms of reparations, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia didn't award any reparations to the victims or the the parties, uh, the, the civilian victims to the crimes of the accused and the uh, those who were held accountable. Its primary role was to deliver justice and hold accountable the leadership of the uh, of the perpetrators. So uh, it didn't have within its jurisdiction to award uh, damages and compensation. However, individual states, they have created mechanisms within their national uh, legislation to award compensation and uh, damages to victims, civilian victims of war, uh, including also for uh, missing persons, as we call them, or uh, enforced disappeared persons. Uh, it's uh, it's namely a matter of the states how they uh, organize their jurisdictions to award uh, such compensation, and there is no uh, in terms of the of the state for their own citizens. Uh, it's no it, it, there is no international obligation how they should organize this compensation. There is, however, obligations, as uh, as Attorney Gonzalez has pointed out, on the uh, responsible states to compensate their victims. And uh, there are various forms of compensation. First, uh, the, just the rendering of the judgment, for example, is considered as as a form of redress to the victim, that they have uh, that they have some. Uh, some relief that those who are responsible for their suffering have been held accountable. On the other hand, monetary compensation is also an instrument used by human rights uh, courts, for example, the European Court and the International, uh, uh, and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And how they dealt with this situation, it, as, uh, uh, as Mr. Gonzalez pointed out, is uh, in differently uh, in based on, on a context of the violations. What I heard in the question was a, a sense of frustration that the wheels of justice are slow but don't let your spirit be crushed by that. I can tell you, you know, two years ago, we filed with a working group on enforced and involuntary disappearances, Handong Daekyo, we filed hundreds and hundreds of petitions with the working group. Within months of that filing, the United Nations created an investigatory body to investigate North Korea for the first time. I think the issue of enforced disappearances was one of the key issues that prompted that significant international action. So keep, keep pushing. Keep fighting. Keep doing the things that you're doing, like this conference. And I think, you know, eventually, God willing, we'll see justice done on this issue.
우리 정부가 절대 다른 차원에서 지금 말씀하신 취지를 어떻게 소화할 수 있는지는 한번 검토해 주시기를 부탁을 드립니다. 네. 그러면 시간이 이제 다 됐기 때문에 첫 번째 세션을 마치도록 하겠습니다. 저는 여기에 오늘 이제 파일을 보면서 여기에 정말 그 가격을 빼앗긴 그 여러분들 아마 그 젊은 나이에 빼앗겼을 텐데 아직까지도 그 고통을 여기에 안고 여기에 오셨던 그 모습을 볼수 있었습니다. 그것은 아까 두 번째 그 손살레 변호사가 말씀하시기 강제실정이나 이런 어, 어, 엄청난 범죄는 정말 공포를 어, 우리 사회에 주는 그러한 범죄이고 이것이 과거에는 우리가 소원될 수 없는 것인 줄 알았었는데 이제는 어, 북한 어, 6.25 어, 어, 전쟁 납북 어, 인사 가족회의와 해외와 같은 NGO들이 열심히 노력을 하고 그것이 국제 NGO들 그리고 어, 정부와 국제기구를 움직여서 어, 앞으로 나아가고 있다고 생각합니다. 우리들 기대에는 너무 미치지 못하지만 이러한 발전이 지금 현재 일어나고 있다는 것을 어, 여러분들이 이, 이제, 에, 이 세션을 통해서 어느 정도는 어, 아셨을 줄 믿습니다. 그래서 어, 우리 먼디 교수님이 말씀하셨듯이 이제 포기하거나 중단하지 말고 계속해서 어, 이러한 시민 어, 운동을 어, 열심히 해주시기를 그 바라는 그런 그 메시지를 우리가 여기서 확인할 수 어, 있었습니다. 그래서 일반적인 어, 이 얘기를 오, 오늘 첫 번째 세션에서는 다루었는데 이제 오후에는 6.25 당시에 그 상기 납치에 관한 것을 중심으로 해서 어, 저희들이 다루도록 하겠습니다. 여러분들 어, 긴 시간 어, 경청해 주시고 참여해 주셔서 대단히 에, 감사합니다. 에, 마지막으로 우리 발표자와 우리 토론자께 에, 감사의 박